Sure. I know. You're gonna see. I'm gonna go so fast. <laughs> so forgive me, but yeah, we'll 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 make it work. We we'll stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, I thank you, Lord, because you are a great God, Lord, a God who provides the best. So, Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the, for the season that we're in right now, Lord, the, the holy 50 days, Lord, where we are just constantly reminded of your goodness on that cross, Lord, the power of your resurrection. I ask that these things be real to us, Lord, that we may walk in them, that we do not live defeated lives, Lord, lives of bondage, but lives, Lord, that are worthy of the sacrifice that you made for us. So, Lord, I ask that you, uh, that you bless the upper room we're in right now, Lord. I ask that your spirit speak loudly and clearly, Lord. I ask that you wrestle with hearts. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord. And I ask the session of all your saints and martyrs. Here's we pray thankfully one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so as you heard downstairs, we're supposed to be done here at 1130. So my watch is set fast. So that gives me probably, I would say, about 20 minutes. So we're going to sprint to the, the, to the finish line here. So just bear with me. I probably will be moving kind of fast. I might be jumping around a little bit just because I'm going to be probably yanking parts out. Um, so just, just, just bear with it. But I, I know that God has a message for us today. I know that there's going to be something we're going to be able to walk away from. Um, or walk away with, so just we'll, we'll do our best here. So, first off, I should have started with Christ is risen. Yes. Truly he is risen, right? It's all 50 days, and I know usually for like the first week, the second week, everyone's like, Christ is risen, truly he is risen. And then like week four, five, six, like everyone else is just kind of kind of ships at sails. But um, it's important, and it's something that not only should we be remembering that for 50 days, we should be remembering that year long. Um, I know that we draw a special emphasis on the 50 days, but really that is so important. It's so foundational. We should be thinking about that like all year long because that the fact that that is true, it, it changes everything. And I will tell you that this is my first Sunday back um, with you guys in, in the meeting uh, since, since the resurrection. And I love the Holy 50 days. It is like my favorite season of the church. I love the way when you walk downstairs into the church, everything is decorated white. I love the joyous tunes that we always celebrate. Um, I love that we have a procession every, every liturgy. I even went to a funeral. Even the funeral is a little bit more joyous. Like the, just the, whole, the focus of the Holy 50 Days is something so special. And I know that we were previously, right before we went into the Holy 50 Days, um, we were doing this uh, series on the miracles of Christ. And I want to continue with that. But I want to pause for a second to kind of to talk about something, right? And I think it's something that we, we probably don't talk about enough and I think we don't talk about it enough because we don't understand it enough. And because we don't understand it enough, we do not experience it enough. And really, it's the cross, right? Like the cross, not just the cross, but especially the cross, because without the cross, there'd be no, it could be interactive. Without the cross, there would be no, the interactive part is when you guys say something too. So without the cross, there's no resurrection. resurrection. Right? And that's like, really, that's what it all comes down to, right? And I think we all love the idea of the resurrection, right? But we, we're not huge fans of the idea of the cross. Um, but when you look throughout the, whole two, the, 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 the New Testament, actually one of the crazy things is if you look into the Old Testament, all you see throughout the Old Testament is symbolism again, again, and again of the cross, right? And the power that it has. And if we're honest, I think a lot, a lot of us, we don't talk about the power enough because in our lives we are not seeing the power, okay? So a lot of the times we know that, especially when we start talking about, like when you look through the book of Romans and St. Paul starts talking about the, you know, the power of the cross, right? The power of the resurrection, all of these things, we get defeated because we look around in our own lives and we wonder, where is that power? Like, I don't see that power in my life, right? Like I see defeat, I see like sin, I see all this other stuff. Well, where's the power? Right? So I'm going to ask you guys a question. You know, in our men's group on Thursday nights, we were just walking through the book of Exodus. We were talking about the Passover and how the Passover was huge foreshadow, huge symbolism of everything that was going to happen on the cross, right? And that Christ himself was a perfect Passover lamb. Even when you break down the Passover and how it was celebrated, the fact that it went like perfectly right in line with everything that happened on the cross, 
right? So I'm going to ask you guys a question. Let's say we go way back to like, you know, back before Christ, you know, back celebrating the first Passover ever. And you get two Jewish families, right? You take these two Jewish families and they clean the house. They make sure that there's not a hint of yeast the way that they're supposed to do it traditionally, right? They bring in the lamb. They kill it without killing any of its bones. They roast it. They season it with like the bitter herbs. They eat it. They take the blood and they put the blood on the door sill, which was the sign for the angel of death to pass over them, right? And one night, one family stays up terrified all night because they know what's going to be happening in, this, uh, in Egypt. They know that the firstborn, and they're up terrified, okay? That second family who did everything ceremonially correct as well, right? And they put the blood on the doorstep, right? Well, when the morning comes, whose firstborn is dead? Neither. Neither, right? Whether or not they stayed up all night terrified or whether or not they slept soundly, right? It had no difference on whether or not their firstborn was dead, right? Because in each one of those two households, they did what they were supposed to do. Right? And when the angel was passing over, were they going from house to house to house, basically saying, how much did they pray? Right? Like, okay, well, did they fast uh, accordingly? Or did they do this? Or did they do, what, what was the angel looking for? The blood. 100% of the time. Why did the angel pass by? Because that family was righteous and that one wasn't? No. It was the blood. Right? And I will tell you, this idea of the Passover is probably the biggest theme in the entire Old Testament. Throughout the whole Old Testament, Right? Wherever they referred to how great God was, what did they always bring up? They brought out how that God freed his people from the land of Egypt. And how was that? It was through the Passover. Because in the 10th plague, it was the 10th plague that it, it changed everything. Right? And that Passover was a sign of the resurrection. Because Pharaoh was a type of Satan who had God's people in heavy bondage. Right? And I know when we go back and we look at the people, uh, the Israelites, when they were in Egypt and we say they were in, heavy, they were in slavery, like literally, like they were slaves in the land of Egypt, right? Heavy bondage. And, but at the same time, we don't make the connection where we say that basically, you know, if Pharaoh was Satan and he had them, you know, in bondage, like, so we're in bondage. We might not be in bondage making, you know, brick and the, whether it was the pyramids or not, like, you know, we don't know, but we're all in bondage to our sin. Right? And, and who's the one who's keeping us there? Satan, 100% of the time. Right? But when you look at the story of the Passover, what freed them from the bondage? The blood. The blood on the doorpost. Right? So we, that being said, like, look, we always have to remember our sins. Right? Our sins are always before us. Right? We always need to repent. We always need to pray. We always need to partake of the Eucharist. We show up here, you know, weekly, if not multiple times a week, right? But we don't walk around terrified. Right? Like we said, like in the first, the, the, the two Jewish households, one terrified, the other one slept like a baby because they knew where the blood was. Right? We don't need to walk around terrified. Um, because that's not what God planned for us. And if you look through the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that we should walk around terror. Should, should we walk around ever conscious of our sin? 100%. Should we walk around always in response of everything that God did for us, for his love compels us to do even more and more? 100%. But it doesn't say walk around terrified, right? Because God freed us by his blood. And we all, and, and, and it's funny because coming out of Holy Week, I know that it was a couple weeks ago now, right? But we all loved Holy Week, right? And, and I love coming in Holy Week because it's the only time you'll show up to a church in the middle of the week and you find the fact that it's, it's crowded, it's packed, right? You come to Good Friday where it's a long day and a lot of, lot of stuff going on, right? But it's packed, you know? And honestly, it kind of reminded me, right? Because, you know, you take what we look like in Holy Week, right? Where you got, you know, you're coming in once a day, you got some people who are coming twice a day and they're so dialed in and they're so serious and they're so focused and they're so doing everything, Right? And I thought about that, right? And then, and then also I started thinking about like the disciples, right? Because the disciples, what was their job Monday, Monday through Sunday, right? They were just, they were walking with Christ, right? And they were just doing whatever Christ told them to do. And they were following, witnessing, seeing miracles. It, it must have been beautiful, right? And I liken that kind of to like our Holy Week because during Holy Week, we can just show up. We can show up twice a day. Right? They're telling us what to pray. They're telling us what to chat. They're telling us what to think about. They're telling us what to focus on. They're walking us through everything, right? 
Um, but then what? But then I liken it to the fact that, like, well, when there was the cross, the disciples, their daily routine changed, didn't it? They had no idea what was going on now, right? Even to the point where when Christ, when Christ died and was buried, you know, they're, I'm sure they woke up the next day and they're like, well, now what do we do, right? We've been following him for the last three and a half years. Like, we never had to think about what we were going to do. He would tell us what to do, right? And I'll be honest with you, and, and if you look at the way that we were living our Holy Week to how we're probably living now, we're just as lost. Because before, we just needed to show up, right? And Holy Week was sped, like, spoon-fed to us, our spirituality. We're do this, do that, do this, do that. And we just needed to follow the flow, and we would be full. But now you got the Holy 50 Days, and we're not coming to church every day. And we're probably just feeling a little bit like the disciples because one of the things that I always think about is what does St. Peter do? St. Peter went back fishing, which was his old way of life before any of that. And I wonder if we were true about that, right? So we had the cross, we had the resurrection, we had all of that power, right, that the Bible talks about. But then what do we tend to do in the Holy 50 Days? We go right back to the way we, we were living before, right? But the thing that we're missing is the cross and the resurrection, right? A lot of us, when we look at the 55-day fast, right, and, and everything that we were going through, and we look at Holy Week, and we look at, like, the feast, like, that's the peak, right? We're like, oh, man, that's the peak. Like, that, that was, it. you know, it is finished, right? It's completed. He resurrected from the dead. But what if I was going to tell you that that was just the beginning, right? What we considered the finale, like, in God's eyes, like, that was just the beginning, right? Because it was on that cross that everything was prophesied about, even from the Old Testament, right? That was the first time since creation that death lost its sting. That was just the beginning, right? And that same power that resurrected Christ from the cross is the same one that's available to us. Never before. Just the beginning. The cross, just the beginning, Right? And St. Peter, when he wasn't being led anymore, he made a mistake to go back to his old way of life. And I want to tell all of us here that whatever we do, we can't make the mistake of going back to our old way of life. When the power of the cross became available, it should have been a game changer for all of us, right? So 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are, who are being saved, it is the power of God. And I love this because the fact that it's basically saying is that there's only two camps here. When we start looking at the power of the cross, it's either A or it's either B, right? It's a message and it will divide us. It's either foolishness or it's power. Foolishness or power. So the question is, is where do we fall in that? Like, which one do we believe in? Like, in your life, which role does the cross play? And do you ever even think about the cross? And then I start thinking about, I say, do we think about his cross? Like, how often do we really, really think about his cross and what was done? Because if we lived with the thought of his cross and everything that had happened, the way that we did during Holy Week, our lives would be different. Not just one week of the year, but 52 weeks of the year. It would be different. Well, why are we so dialed in on that week? Because that's exactly what we're thinking about, right? So we need to be thinking about his cross, but the other side of it is, are you thinking about your cross? Every one of us has a cross. There's not a single person living that doesn't have a cross. But the question is, is are you picking it up and are you carrying it? Because I feel like that's the thing. Like, yeah, we'll acknowledge we have a cross, but we're just, we don't want to pick it up and we don't want to carry it, right? And one of the beautiful things about the cross is that it's all about the cross. Like, it begins with the cross, it ends with the cross, it is all about the cross, and the cross is where we find fullness. We won't find it anywhere else, you know? Because if you've ever looked for fullness somewhere else, I guarantee you, you get disappointed. Because nothing else will ever fill us. Nothing else will ever satisfy us, right? How many people do you know that, come to, that don't come to church anymore? Who may have shown up at church, right? But they fall away from church because someone has disappointed them. Someone's offended them. Maybe somebody treated them the way they didn't like. Somebody was rude. Um, you know, they felt that people were gossiping about them. And they, and they came looking for a place to fit in or they needed someone to show them God's love. Someone showed them. But here's the reality of it is, is no matter what it is, people will always disappoint you 100% of the time. Whether it's a friendship, whether it's a parent, whether it's a spouse, 
because people are not perfect, right? But the thing is, is, is people will never be able to give you happiness. People will never be able to give you fulfillment. People will never be able to satisfy you. People will never ever give you completeness because the only place we can find that is at the cross. It's through Christ, right? And it's weird. It's a hard concept to understand, right? Because we know that people can give us praise. We know that people can give us gifts. We know that people can give us attention, affirmation, power, respect, hope, and we love that stuff. We feel so much energy and so much life when we receive those stuff. And however, however much we chase those things, that ends up being a false god in our life. Where we start going after that stuff thinking that that's where happiness is. That's where fulfillment will be. That's, that's the stuff that gives me life, but it will never give you life. And a matter of fact, if that's where you think that you're going to get life, we forget the cross. Because the cross, the cross teaches us it's not about finding life. It's about finding death. You know... It's almost like if you've got kids, right? Like if, you, if you've got kids, you know, kids, they want to snack all day, right? They want to go into the pantry. They want to grab sugar. They want to grab gummy bears. They want to grab junk food like all day long. And the problem is, is yeah, I can pump that stuff all into my kid. Will my kid ever sit down for a well-balanced meal? Will he ever have a source of protein that can sustain him? Will I ever give him something that he needs to actually grow? Never. But I feel like spiritually, that's what we're settling for all of the time. Give me the stuff that tastes good. Give me the stuff that feels good. Give me all of this praise from the other people, right? Because that's where I'm going to find all of this stuff, right? It gives me the warm and fuzzies. But God is saying that just because it tastes good or it smells good or it feels good doesn't mean it is good. And sometimes what's good is the cross, which just blows our mind, right? And the problem is, is when we start chasing after all of that stuff that we get from, or that we feel that we're going to get from the other people. And I know that every single one of us is, has felt this in our life, right? Where you chase all of that stuff that we're getting from relationships, it only will disappoint you. And you run harder after it and only disappoint you harder. So it's, it's bad. So let's not get confused, right? It's not about just, it's not about relationships, which God bless us. The reason that we are a church, the reason that the church is a body of Christ is because we all need relationships. There's a reason why we're not all worshiping at home. There's a reason why we're not still, still doing this on Zoom, right? Because we need each other and we need relationships, but the relationships will never make you whole. The only thing that will make you whole is Christ. The only place to find it is the cross, right? It's not about just coming here. It's not just about chanting. It's not about routine. It's not about our friends. It's not about praise. It's not about just hanging out. Right? There's got to be a bigger, cause than, uh, a bigger calling than that. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.2, For I have determined not to know anything among you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. And this is St. Paul, wrote you know, half of the New Testament. He's basically saying the only thing worth knowing is Christ and him uh, crucified. And I'm going to tell you something, right? Like, in, in Mark 8, St. Peter proclaims that, that, that Christ is the Messiah, okay? And then it's funny because after, later, you know, I'm going to read this passage. I want you guys to think about something. It says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke this word openly, right? This is where Christ was teaching them. And Peter took him aside Wrap your mind around this, right? So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned around and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And what God is basically saying here is like, the cross must happen. Like what I am telling you, what's going to happen to me, the betrayal, all, like the cross must happen. Right? Because that's the type of God that I am. Like, don't miss that. Like, that's the type of God that I am. That is the type of love that I have for you. That is the type of sacrifice that I am willing to do for your behalf. And for you to think that I won't be that God is satanic. It's satanic. Right? The, the idea that Christ wouldn't give himself for us is a thought from Satan. And, you know, I, I was thinking about this and, and the actual cause of Christ's crucifixion, right? The actual cause of his execution, like why he died. 
He died for being who he was. Like, no, a lot of times he's like, oh, you know, blasphemy, this and that, and all this other. Like, no, no, no. He, he died just for being the Christ, right? They didn't want him to be the Christ. They didn't want him to rule over their lives. They were not interested in what, they had, what he had to offer them, right? They wanted to reign their own way. And I will tell you, if we were honest with ourselves, we want to reign our own way too, don't we? Right? Because Christ comes and he tells us how to do it, right? And he tells us, this is what I'm expecting. This is how you respond. This and this is this. Like, this is my way. It's a narrow path. It's all of the die to yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. And there's a lot of us that might be looking at him and saying the same thing they were looking at him 2,000 years saying and saying, I don't know if I'm interested in that. You know, like, I, I appreciate that you're here, but I, I don't want you to reign. And we might have to be honest with ourselves about that because a lot of the times we want to be our own gods. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do what I see fit. And then if you have a problem with that, you just can't stay here. Right? Because everyone's been given a cross. The question that I often ask myself is who will hang on it? Everybody has a cross. The question, who will hang on it? Right? Somebody has to die. If you have a cross, someone has to die. So the question is, 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 will you die on that cross that's been handed to you? Is that something that you're willing to pick up? Something that you're willing to carry? Something that you're willing to do in a hard manner? Right? Or will it slowly kill Christ's presence in our life completely? Because that's, that's what I fear a lot of us, a lot of us are, are choosing, right? And we can't have the power of the resurrection without the power of his death. Like we must die to self and only then, only after we die, can we get to see the power. And then honestly, I know I just hit my, my time limit. So I'm going to leave you guys with just this verse. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ that lives in me. And I just want you guys to think about that. Can you imagine what it would be like to live a life where you actually feel that Christ is living inside of you? that there's actual clear communication when Christ is guiding you, right? That's all I want. And, you know, I, I had more, but, you know, we, I think we got to go downstairs. But think about that. Each one of us given a cross. Each one of us asked to pick it up and to carry it. Each one of us asked to die to ourselves. And the question is, someone's going to die, but who will it be? Amen? All right. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the cross, Lord. We thank you because you're not just the God who told us to pick up our cross. You're not a God who's just asking us to carry our cross, Lord, but you were the one that modeled us how to do it. And Lord, truly, the amount of love and grace that you pour out on us, Lord, the encouragement, Lord. So Lord, I ask that you just give us eyes to see what you see, Lord. Because I know that when you look at this group of uh, people standing up, in front of you, Lord, that you see something that, that's beyond what we see with our own eyes, Lord. You see the good inside of us. You see the purpose that you've created us for. You've seen what we look like if we live out our potential. So, Lord, I ask that, that you just open our eyes to that, Lord, and you let us know that we'll never, ever get to our potential unless we do that what you've commanded, which is that we need to get up, pick up our cross, and that we need to carry it, Lord. So, Lord, I ask uh, in this in this coming week, Lord, as you give us opportunities to do that, Lord, where you give us opportunities, Lord, just to, to show us what your calling for us is and what your purpose for us is and what it's like, Lord. I know that you, in Ephesians, you've told us, Lord, that you've laid out good works for us to walk through. I ask that you open our eyes to that stuff, Lord, and that you guide us and that your hand be mighty and that your voice be loud. I thank you for, for the cross. I thank you for the power of your resurrection, Lord. I thank you for this beautiful theme, uh, the season, of our church, Lord, and that you be glorified in everything that we do. Hear these prayers, lift in the session of all our saints and our tears. Here should we pray with one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, by his kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.